This is a DC motor. So what type of voltage do we typically apply to a DC motor, do you think? DC. DC, but we don't actually, right? What we actually apply is an AC voltage, right? Well, and, and why do we do that? Well, because um, we, first of all, applying a, a controllable, this has a controllable DC value right here, right? Think, think about this guy right here. This this is v, VM, the voltage I'm applying to the motor, right? How could I, this, this thing is a periodic waveform, right? So we call this pulse width modulation, right? So it, what I do is I, I modulate or change the width of this pulse right here. So that means you keep the frequency constant, but you change the width, so you change D, right? If I change D, what component of this, of, so that this guy, if he's periodic, he's got a Fourier series, right? So one of the, one of the frequencies in that Fourier series is clearly gonna be DC, right? Because this guy is offset from zero. Right. If I change the value of D, what's going to happen to the the DC component of this? In other words, the the zero frequency term of this guy. What's going to happen to it? Like if I if I make D bigger. In fact, let's say I make D equal to one. Right. If D was equal to one, what would this waveform look like? If if D became equal to one, where would this edge move to? T, move all the way over to T, it'd be a flat line, right? If D was equal to zero, I wouldn't have anything, right? If D was equal to 0.5, this guy would be high half the time and low half the time, right? So I'm changing the average value. So we went through a, through a video example of that last time where I said, all right, if I, if I apply this to the motor, we said the motor has a low pass behavior to it. Low pass means what? It allows low frequencies to go through. So if I choose a frequency, so choose a frequency for this waveform that's high enough that the har harmonics don't pass through the filter, what I'll see is a very <coughs> constant speed here because it's like I'm just applying a DC voltage to the input. Now, if it was if it was a really slow waveform, then all of the harmonics would pass through. And we did this last time, and I'll link to that video if you if you want to look at it. But basically, if I go to slow frequency, it went the motor spun and then stopped, and then it spun again and it stopped. Right when I did it a high enough frequency, it spun at a constant rate, and as I changed the duty ratio, it changed how fast it was spinning because I was basically applying a higher voltage to it. Now. <clears throat> That turns out to be a really simple way for a computer to control something, right? Because it's very easy for a computer to control timings of pulses, right? That's a very simple thing to, to be able to do in a computer. Um, and this is also a very efficient way to drive something, right? To, to create a controllable DC voltage source is not a, not a particularly easy thing to do. Um, the only way you could really do that was to use a potentiometer, right? The thing that's bad about a potentiometer is potentiometer is a resistor which means that there's going to be losses in it. This waveform here, I can create with a set of switches, right? What do I know about a switch? If I close a switch, switch is lossless, right? But it's basically a wire when it's closed and it's an open circuit when it's opened, right? So in theory, that switch is a lossless device. And that's why we, we do it that way. More detail than we need to get into right here. But what I wanted to do was to look at sort of an example system. And we started doing that the other day, all right? So the concept we're talking about here is you've got a system. In, this, in my example, it's a motor, right? But it could be a circuit, it could be, could be anything. I, I said the other day, right, these lights in the room here are also flickering at a particular value. There is something called a driver in there that's driving the LEDs, right? And that driver is basically turning the LEDs on and off at a certain rate. Your eye is not seeing that because physiologically, your eye is low pass filtering those variations, right? So there, so I, there's all sorts of systems that can be modeled this way, right? So what I'm saying is I got an input, it goes into a system that has a transfer function and I get an output, all right? And so what we typically want to do is, is we want to either design the input or design the system to get a particular response, all right? In the case of the motor, 
the motor is the system, right? There's nothing I can do about the motor itself. I don't typically design motors. I buy motors. They come designed, right? So there's nothing I can change about the H of omega. The H of omega is what it is. But I can change some things about my input. In other words, I can change this guy. So what can I change about this input? Well, the D value is the thing that I change to control it, right? But I can I can design the frequency, right? I can say, well, what frequency would be a good one to choose? All right, to do that, I got to create some specifications for my system. So, so in theory, a lot of what you're learning in, in all your classes really is how to take the math and the theory to be able to do what you would have normally done by just goofing around with the system until it worked, right? The whole idea of what you're really trying to do here is to get you out of the goofing around phase into how do I actually use this stuff to think about, you know, getting a particular behavior, all right? So the example I, I gave the other day, I said, all right, that motor behaves like a low-pass filter, okay? And, and so I, I, I took an RC circuit low-pass filter here, and the low-pass filter that I've got, it's just like the motor. So basically, I'm saying it's got a time constant that's fixed. I can't change anything about this. The, it, it is what it is. But I'm going to change the frequency of my input to get my output to look a certain way, all right? So... Um, in this case, I'm applying a voltage, which is five volts and then zero volts. All right. And its frequency is unknown to me. I want to choose its frequency. Okay. So what I did last time is I said, okay, well, let's draw the Fourier transform magnitude of that. So that's a series of impulses, right? And that particular, uh, the way we figured that out is VN of omega. Um, becomes this um, summation like this, alpha n delta omega minus n omega naught like that. And we figured out what the alpha n values were, right? So just to, so this, this guy here would be alpha one, this guy here would be alpha minus one, right? And, and again, these are magnitudes. So I want to ask you, so what would be the fundamental frequency? What would the fundamental frequency term look like in the in the out in the input here? All right. So I want to say what's Vn? Hopefully you know how to do this because you took a test on it last night. If I called that, if this magnitude here is alpha one, right? What is how would I write this the cosine wave that exists at omega naught? What would be the formula for it? Yep. 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 Two times magnitude alpha one times cosine of omega naught t plus the angle of alpha one, like that. Okay. And if I if I go in, um, which we're gonna do for this particular waveform, we'll do it a little bit. Uh, it's gonna be one point five. In fact, let me just write out alpha. Alpha is gonna be this. Alpha will be 1.5915 uh, J, right? Actually, I think it's minus J. What's that mean? That it means that alpha's magnitude is 1.59, right? And what's the negative J mean? Angle's negative 90. Right. You guys should be getting pretty fluent and being able to for something like that to figure out what the angle is. Right. So that means that that VN1 here, what would be its amplitude? A little bit more than three volts, right? A little bit more than three volts. Um and you know, in, in looking at that there, that means the its amplitude is a little bit more than three volts. So what's its peak to peak value? About six. All right, we can get the exact numbers, but the peak to peak is from the top to the bottom. Because remember, amplitude is from the middle to the top, okay? Usually when we measure things, we usually do the peak to peak value because that's what's really easy to see on an oscilloscope or something like that is the peak to the to the bottom, okay? All right, so what I, what I said last time is I want V out of T to be a constant, okay? All right, now... This guy is, is a low pass filter at 
at DC, without doing any math on this thing, I just want to figure out at DC, what's the output going to be? At DC, what's the output going to be? Well, we can figure that out pretty easily here. What's the what's the average? What's the DC component of VN? What's the magnitude of the DC component? For what I drew right there, you should be able to just look at that and tell. And there's no math required to do, no hard math, no integrals. What's So how do I figure out the, yeah, well, just from looking at that graph, how can I figure out what the value is? Yeah, okay, so it's five volts for half the period. Two, so it'll be so it'll be yeah so the average will be two point five right so I'll end up saying that this guy is uh, the DC term on this I guess I'll call it VN zero would be two point five volts all right now basically what I'm saying is is that that means I could think of this input voltage here as basically being a summation of a bunch of different sources. One of them at DC, one of them at the fundamental, one of them at the second harmonic, one of them at the third harmonic. And I can, if I have a summation of sources, I can use superposition to think about it, right? So if I had a 2.5 volt source right here, what would the output be across the capacitor? Be 2.5. In steady state, at least it would be 2.5, right? Why do I know that? Because the capacitor is an open at DC. So there'd be no current flowing through that circuit. So 2.5 volts was what I'd have across the capacitor. All right. So my goal is for the output voltage. My design goal is for the output voltage to be a constant. Okay. <laughs> so what does that mean in this case? All right. So based on what we just said here, that I want V out to be, V out of T should be 2.5 volts. Like that. All right, I want that guy to be a constant. Now, V out of omega, all right, what would that look like? What would that look like? So if I took the Fourier transform of that thing, what does that look like? Single impulse, yeah, 2.5 volts. Now, to make that happen, what we know here is that V out of omega is equal to H of omega times V in of omega, like that, okay? So what does that mean about the magnitude of H of omega? If I want this to happen, if I want V in to look like this, or it does look like this, and I want V out to look like this. That imposes a constraint on H of omega, doesn't it? What's H of omega have to be at all of these frequencies? In other words, what's the magnitude of H at omega naught have to be for this to work? For me to have nothing at omega naught in the output. Zero, right? Now, what I said is that's not physically possible, right? And that's certainly not happening with the, I mean, to say that that's not physically possible is something that I know to be true, right? That's not possible. But certainly for this system, we can see that it's not possible, right? Because I can figure out H of omega pretty easily. So from, we, we talked about this last time, how do I figure out H of omega? Well, I can get it from the differential equation, but that's never never your friend, right? What's the what's the easiest way probably for you guys to figure out that H of omega from input to output? What would you do? What circuit? What kind of circuit is that thing? Well, it's first order. It's in series. It's a voltage divider, right? And so if I use the voltage divider relationship, I find out that this transfer function is one over J omega tau plus one where tau is RC, right? So that's that's my transfer function. Now, the thing to remember is it's a function. What I'm saying is this is a complex number that is a function of a real frequency, right? So that the frequency omega is a real number. And it's a function because I want to look at what it looks like versus frequency. I'm not trying to pull off one value, right? I am trying to look at this thing as a function of frequency. I want to graph H of omega, okay? 
All right, so this guy cannot possibly be equal to zero at omega equal to any real frequency, right? How, why do I know that? What's true about this about this guy here? Well, how, at what value of omega does this thing have to be? What value of omega would I need for h of omega to be equal to zero? Nope, certainly not. I mean, just looking at this from a math perspective, what value of omega would I have to have for this thing? Infinity, right? The only possible value of, of omega that could zero that thing out would be omega equal to infinity. Now, what you, what, what you just said is, is the way that we're going to try to practically approach this, right? Is, is to say, all right, well, I, I have certain frequency ranges where it's equal to one, right? For low frequencies, this guy is equal to one. For high frequencies, it starts to approach zero. Never gets to zero, but starts to approach it. So in other words, I can't, I can't create this constraint that I want, where the constraint that I want would be for the magnitude to equal zero at that point. What I can do instead is I can try to make the value smaller, right? So what I do is I made up a constraint. And this is typically what you'll do. You'll, you'll try to say, okay, well, what I want is I want to choose a fundamental frequency. So the amplitude of the sine wave at the fundamental is less than 5% of the DC value, all right? So what I'm saying is, is if I looked at the output, so here's T. Here's V out. In steady state, this guy is going to be at 2.5 volts. Plus, he's going to have a little sine wave riding on top of him. And I'm saying I want to choose the amplitude of the sine wave at that frequency to be less than 5% of the DC value. Okay. All right. So the way that I think about this is in the context of the frequency domain. So if I drew the magnitude here, this is 2.5, right? That's the DC term. And then I have something at omega naught. All right, this guy was alpha, was what I call alpha one, right? So what's the amplitude of the, of the sine wave at the fundamental frequency? How do I write that in terms of this alpha one here? How do I write the amplitude of that term? What would it be? Yeah, so it's two times that, two times that, right? So what I'm saying here is I want, I want to write this out mathematically. What I'm saying is I want V out at omega naught, right? two times that magnitude, right, is equal to the amplitude of the cosine or sine that exists at that frequency, okay? So I'm saying I want that value to be less than 5% of the DC value. So how do I express that? I want that to be less than 5% of the DC value. So how would I write that? Well, all right. What's the DC value? How do I express the DC value? Well, yeah, so 0 0.05 times, let's, let's just write it out. You, you gave me the right number there, right? So I would write that as V out of what frequency? What's DC? V out of what frequency? Zero, right? I'm saying I want the, this is, this is putting it, so I put a constraint here on the amplitude uh, at omega naught, right? So I'm saying I want the amplitude at omega naught, which is two times that magnitude of V out to be less than 5% of the DC value, all right? So if I plug in some numbers there, so, so basically um, V out of omega naught, should be less than 5% of 2.5 divided by 2, which if I work that out, I think that comes to, what did I get? 0 0.0625. Oh, 
Well, yeah, 0 0.0625, all right, is what that works out to be, right? Did I do that right? Two times. I think I did that right. Yeah, that's right. All right, <clears throat> so 0 0.0625. All right, so that tells me here what this guy needs to be. So what do I, what do I, what do I do with that? Right. What do I do with that? Well, so I've told myself what this needs to be. So what do I do next? Now that I have this, I'm saying this is, this is what I need to have happen. All right. Now, the thing that we know is that V out of omega naught is equal to H of omega naught times V in of omega naught, right? And I can write that in terms of magnitudes. All right, what's the magnitude of V in of omega naught? We know that because we've got the Fourier transform of it, right? So I'm saying I want this guy to be 0 0.0625. Magnitude of H of omega naught is this. I don't have a number for that just yet because I don't have an omega naught. Right, that was the thing. I'm saying I don't have an omega naught. I don't know the frequency of this thing. I'm trying to figure out what frequency to get to, right? I've given myself a goal of trying to have V out of omega to be less than 0 0.0625. So I want to choose a frequency that's going to make that happen. So I, I'm saying 0 0.0625 is equal to H of omega naught times V in of omega naught. Now, no matter what frequency I have, we said that this magnitude was 1.5915. That tells me that the magnitude of H of omega naught, to make this work, the magnitude of that should end up being 0 0.0393. All right, something less than, specifically, that, that's what it worked out to be, but I want it to be less than that, right? Less than that, making sure that it'll be that my output will be less than five percent of the DC value. Okay, you guys, follow the process, right? I'm basically saying this is what I want to have happen. Now I need to choose <coughs> omega naught to make it happen. All right. So how would I do that? All right. Now how would I do that? What do I have to do to make that happen? Well, we know what H of omega looks like. Yeah, I told you the tau value here is 0.5 seconds, right? So I, I didn't give you the R and C exactly, but, I, but you know what they are together, right? So how would I do this? What do I have to do? Well, do I know what this is? Yeah, I so so the transfer function was <laughs> this j omega tau plus one, right? And omega naught is is the specific frequency we'd be solving for. And I could solve it, right? But we don't typically do that. What we typically do is we draw the graph of of h of omega, and we because we don't because you guys have been trained your whole life up until now. You've been doing all this training in math to find numbers with your stupid calculator that that will have five digits of, of accuracy, right? But that's not the way the world works, right? The way the world really works is there's only a finite number of resistors and capacitors in the world, right? So what you do is you say, all right, I need it to be less than this particular value. So I just say, well, that means it needs to be less than this. And so I usually choose a whole number of some sort, right? That is, that's going to meet the constraint. I don't need to solve to get some exact point in frequency, right? No one cares about that. They care that I cross that threshold with enough, with enough conservative estimate that I'm definitely going to meet my specification, okay? So what I do is I draw a graph. And I, I look on that graph and say, okay, where is the frequency at which this is true? And then I'm going to choose a frequency that's a little bit higher than that. And I know I'll be fine. All right. So <clears throat> how do we do this? So what I do is I draw 
the graph of this this the, this particular thing. So I draw the graph of the magnitude of h of omega, which is one over square root of omega squared tau squared plus one squared, right? Which I don't like to to draw. What I do is I this is how I code that. All right. Now you you if you know how to use the Bode command in MATLAB, which you may now, right? Um, what I did was I created an omega vector, right? Here's my transfer function. And then I basically plotted omega versus the absolute value of h. Now, how, so my goal was to choose omega naught so that the magnitude was less than 0 0.0393. <laughs> so where, so how do I do that here? So there's the magnitude on the y-axis. Yeah, so where's point zero? So I'm looking for where it's less than point zero three nine three. I don't know. That's like somewhere down here, I think. Right. Now the problem with plotting the magnitude of this thing is it's it's really it's kind of a hard graph to look at, right? Because it's all the action kind of happens right here, right? And then it sort of disappears on me. Right. It looks like it's equal to to something, it looks like it's fallen off and then it's just zero, right? Um, that's kind of the way it looks. And that, that's not a very easy way to look at this thing. So what we do is we want to zoom in on the graph. All right. So you guys probably know this now from in circuits, circuits two, right? But what, what can I do to zoom in on that? Well, I can plot this thing on a logarithmic scale. All right. So what I do is, is this. Here's, here's logs give me the ability to zoom in. All right. So I, I wrote out basically numbers here from 1,000 to 0 0.01. So let's see if you know, what is that? So going from 100 to 1,000 or 10 to 100 or 1 to 10, what do we call that? A decade, right? Not, to, not a decade like in the context of the 90s or whatever, right? But a decade in the context of a, a sort of a factor of 10 in, in frequency, right? So if I take the log, and, I, and I'm careful to say log 10, log base 10. The reason is because MATLAB, if you type log into MATLAB, it thinks that that is what you are. It thinks that's ln, all right. So, so you guys complain about how you've lost days of your life goof, goofing around with stuff in MATLAB. This was sometime around two, the year two thousand. I lost a day of my life with that one, right? <laughs> Just so you know, yeah, yeah. It was it's it's memorable. I can't I can't forget it, all right? Log ten. Is, is the way you do the log in, in MATLAB. So how do I do that? What's the log base 10 of one? Zero, okay. What's the log base 10 of 10? One. Of 100? Two. Thousand is three. What's point one? Negative one. And this guy would be negative two. So if you think about that, so 0 0.01 is about, I don't know, it's, if I, so I tried to draw this out. Here's the omega axis. Uh, here's a thousand, let's say. So there's a thousand. So that would put 100, about 10% of that. So 100 would be about here. 10 would be about here, right? If I, if I plot this now in the logarithmic axis, I can't even, I'm not going to be able to effectively draw the rest of them, right? They could just get closer and closer to the origin. What happens when I put that on a logarithmic scale, though? Well, a thousand could still be here, right? So, so on a logarithmic scale, the way I think about this is, we, let's call this three. Uh, let's call this, well, three, one, Two, zero. I didn't give myself enough space here. Negative one. Didn't think about what it was going to look like. Like that, right? So what do those correspond to in frequency? Well, this is 10 to the third, right? This is 10 squared. This is 10, 1, 0 0.1. Basically, what I'm doing is, is all of this stuff that got shoved in close to zero is getting expanded out so I can see it better. And that's helpful to me because if I look at this, there's a lot of crap going on down towards zero. Right, so this allows me to kind of zoom in and see all that activity that's happening. 
so so this is the way to to kind of look at this. Now, can I ever see DC? No, why not? Because what's the log of zero? Negative infinity. Yeah, basically it's all the way off to the far, 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 far left. All right. If you start thinking about that though, if I have a frequency of like 0. 0.00001 hertz, that gets to be, you know, the, the one over that frequency is something like, you know, a day, right? And so you're not usually talking about applying a voltage to a circuit for a whole day, right? So, so the meaning of DC gets kind of funny at some point. All right. So the logarithmic plot is typically the way that we look at this. All right. And to make things all the, the more confusing, we plot things on a logarithmic axis, but we use a term called the decibel. All right. Um, to look at the magnitude. All right. And there's a historic reason for that, but we, but it's done in 20 times the log base 10 of the magnitude. Okay. So 20 log 10 of the magnitude. So what we typically do is I take something like the constraint that I had up here, right? So I wanted the magnitude to be less than 0 0.0393 and I turn that into a decibel constraint, okay? Now, how did I make the graph that I have right here? Well, the way I did that was with this code here and I introduced a couple of new uh, terms that you guys haven't used in MATLAB before. One of them is this guy here, log space, all right? So log space is a command that generates for me a set of numbers on a logarithmic scale. All right. And, and what this does, I said log space of 10 to the, so log space minus two to 1000. All right. The 1000 tells me how many total points it's going to generate. And the first two numbers are the exponents for the end point and the start point. All right, so it's basically, it's gonna start at 10 to the minus two is my start. And I'm gonna end at 10 to the two. All right, that's that's basically what this guy ends up doing for me. If I, if I make that graph, okay? And um, what I've done here, is I've plotted this thing using a command called semi-log x, okay? What semi-log x does is it's gonna take those omega values and it's gonna make my x-axis, just my x-axis logarithmic, all right? And that's what leads to the graph that I have right here, okay? This is for that to be the case, all right? Now, um, what do I, so that's, that gives me this graph. So what do I, what do I do with all this? Well, let's go back to what we had said before, right? So I created a constraint for myself. I said, I wanted the magnitude of H at omega naught to be less than 0 0.0393, right? So what do I do? I got to turn that into a logarithmic constraint, right? So that means I want 20 log 10 of h of omega naught to be less than a particular value. So how do I determine what that's going to be? Well, I take 20 times the log 10 of that number. And I, if I do that, it works out to be uh, somewhere around the order of about negative 28 decibels, right? So this guy works out to be about negative 28 dB. What does it mean for a logarithm to be negative? It's gonna be a number smaller than one. Okay. So what's that mean in terms of the magnitude? That means that the so if, if I if a logarithm is equal to zero, that means that the, the thing I'm taking the logarithm of is one. So in the context of a transfer function, that means input and output are the same, right? Because I'm basically the, the output is the input times the transfer function. So if it's less than one, means I'm making the output smaller, right? So <clears throat> how do I use this, right? Again, my goal was to choose a frequency, so this was true. How would I use this? Well, I'd go to that graph and I would try to find 
where's negative 28? Well, negative 28 is somewhere around here, right? I'd basically try to say, okay, well, let's find a point on this curve that is greater than, so, or has, a, has an H value that is less than negative 28. And that's the frequency I'm going to choose. So I could just say, let's go to negative 29, right? So how do I do that? Basically, what I did in MATLAB here is I used the data tip in here. And I just basically moved this guy along. And I found where I got to negative 29. And you don't need to be that careful about it. Like, I tried to get to negative 29. You could, just, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to choose it to be negative 37. Nothing wrong with that. Right, I could just take these numbers out and use them, okay? Because this is going to be having a magnitude less than 0 0.0393, right? And I don't need to worry about hitting some particular special number. I just know that if I choose this frequency here, I should be good to go. I should get a magnitude that's less than my requirement, okay? So what I did was I did this guy here. I said... Um, if I choose omega naught to be equal to this guy right here, that 50, 56.3843 radians per second, if I choose that, then the magnitude that I choose will be equal to negative 29.008 dB. And I should meet my constraint. Okay. So what I want to do with that is I want to say to myself, all right, well, then if this is the case, what do I think the amplitude's going to be at that particular frequency? Well, I can figure that out by saying, all right, 20 log 10 of the magnitude of H of omega naught is equal to negative 0008. So how do I figure out what the actual H of omega naught is there? Okay, yeah. So 10, yeah. So so you, you divide both sides by 20 and then raise both sides of the power of 10. So it'd be 10 to the negative 29.008 divided by 20 equals, um, I think the number that I work out too with that Let's see, I calculated it in my MATLAB code. Um, is, what did I call it? H, F, oh, maybe not. What did I call it? It's unhappy with me. What did I call it? I called it H final, there we go. All right. So what I did was I said, all right, well, it's, it's equal to this number here. And then I said, all right, I want to figure out what's the amplitude of the output going to be. So what did I write here? Two times 1.5915 times H final. What was this? That was the amplitude of the input, right? So I do that multiplication, and that tells me that this guy is 0 0.1128, all right? 0 0.1128. And because this is a cosine wave, right? Half of that, my goal was to get to get the, the magnitude of the Fourier transform to be less than 0 0.0625. This says I got it to be 0 0.0564, all right? Now, that's the design. How would I actually verify if it works? I'd have to build the damn thing, right? And actually and actually see if it worked. So how am I gonna make you do that in here? What's that? Well, you could, I mean, you could you could go and well, yeah, you could build some hardware and do it, or I could simulate the system. Now, how could I simulate the system? MATLAB, right? It's an RC circuit, right? And you guys know how to make a simulation of an RC circuit. You did that in the first project, right? So what I did was I simulated it. Right. And that's what you're going to be doing. Right. So I write this simulation. I run it. Now, let's, this, this is what I got as my result. Now, we're going to look at this a little bit more on Monday. But when I look at that here, that was the input. I got a square wave going zero to five volts there. That's the blue going back and forth. My output is the red. 
So what did I want the output to be? Let's try to zoom out onto the bigger picture here. What did I want the output to be? I wanted it to be one single line. And what did I want the value of that single line to be? 2.5 volts. All right. Now, first of all, if I look at this, I do have some variation. I have some ripple going on there. Right. Well, around what value out here? 2.5. So I got what I wanted to there. Right. Um, is my ripple, we'll have to look at that more carefully on Monday if my see if my ripple's the right size. What's going on at the beginning? I thought this guy was supposed to be constant. Why do I have that? Because there's a transient. In a real system, there's a transient. When I look at that, when I look at that Fourier transform, right, I'm basically assuming that my output's gotten a steady state. Right. So that's so so when I look at the real world system, we 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 moved over all doing all this Fourier stuff. We basically said, you know what, all that transient stuff we're gonna forget about because it doesn't last that long. Right. I can stay in the steady state for a long time. All right. So that's that's one thing that's a little bit different here. I get this transient that I gotta look out for. All right. So I so here's here's where I have all right. So I got the 2.5 I wanted to. If I look at the peak to peak value on this, we'll talk about this a little bit more on Monday because I know I'm up on time. But the peak to peak value on this, I did record a shot of this. Let's see, is specifically that to that, that's 2.785. All right. Now, my predicted value was 0.2257. Right. In other words, I said if I had a fundamental term, it should have been 0.2257, but it's actually 0.2. 785. So I said it was going to be 0.22. It's actually 0.27. Why am I wrong? Is that a sine wave? It's not a trick question. Is that a sine wave? No, it's not a sine wave. Right? <laughs> no, it's not like no, it's not. Why is it not a sine wave? I said it was going to be a sine wave. Why is it not a sine wave? What was true about my input? So the, the input had all these harmonics, right? I only did my analysis here at the fundamental frequency, but there's what? What else is there? There's other harmonics, right? I haven't zeroed them out either. So, so what I'm actually seeing here is a little bit bigger than what I predicted, right? That makes sense because there's other harmonics that I haven't included in my analysis. If I think this is too big, what could I do as, a, as an alternative? <laughs> If I think this is too big, what should I change? Frequency. Yeah, and what should I do with the frequency? Go up, right? If I go up, I'm just going to make the stuff get smaller and smaller. Eventually, I can make that ripple look purely sinusoidal. And if I keep going far enough, eventually I'll make it so it looks pretty darn constant. All right, that's the way you typically tend to think about this stuff. If I know what the transfer function looks like, I can just choose a value. Or alternatively, I can basically choose, in some problems, choose the transfer function given the frequency to, to get a particular value. Those are the sorts of things you're going to be messing with on the, on the project. All right, that's it.